Africa's population is estimated at 1.2 billion people. Of that number, 420 million are youth aged between the ages of 15 and 35. Other official statistics put the population of youth below the age of 24 in Africa at 680 million people. Every single year, Africa welcomes into the job market 10 to 12 million young people. But sadly, only 3 million are able to find formal employment. Closer to home in Botswana, our unemployment rate is trending at about 40%, higher than some of our, our neighbors, Namibia and Zambia, and possibly further afield, Lesotho, at about 33%. Lower than South Africa, which is trending much higher at 52%, and Mozambique. Botswana aspires to be in the league of upper middle income countries. But if you look at our unemployment statistics, we're trending higher than those countries, which are sitting at 14.6%. Our figures are also higher than those of sub-Saharan Africa at 14.1%. Ladies and gentlemen, deeply troubling statistics by any measure. And this statistics could be repeated for any other African country. So what is going on here? And these numbers, we've been warned many, many times that if we're not careful, they can lead to major social and political upheaval. And if you want to have a keen sense of the dignity of not having work, of not being employed, sometimes it's actually made crystal clear in the pronouncements of some of the young people we talk to. Take the case of Sepo, who's been looking for employment and has been unsuccessful, and he wonders why he cannot drive a fancy car, a BMW, like some of his peers. Or Cabello, who's chosen a life of drugs, or a life of crime, rather, and possibly drugs as well, since he's unable to actually find a job and he's given up. Or Alice, who's taking solace in hard drugs as a way to actually ease the pain and maybe even the shame of not being employed. Take the case of Tab. He's given up. He's tried for the past two or three years. He's been unable to find a job, and yet is a graduate. And he's considered a suicide. I fundamentally believe that in Africa, instead of actually creating jobs, we're creating untold misery and deep frustration amongst the youth. And normally the youth, if they don't like a system, we've been told, they have a tendency to destroy it. This is why I care. This is why I feel we have not quite applied our minds to try and sort out the youth unemployment question. Now, the problem is further exacerbated by the promise of the coming fourth industrial revolution, which promises possibly a jobless future, where certain professions as we know them could easily disappear. This coupled with education system in Africa or systems in Africa that are almost comatose. It's almost like they're ignoring this mega trend. And they're not keeping up with this mega trend because they're not transforming in a way that we can all be convinced that our youth will have employment in this new future. So the promise of the African demographic div dividend, the numbers that I've spoken about, could easily turn into a nightmare. So where are the jobs? It's well understood in any economy, government and private sector drivers of economic growth and job creation. 
The case of Mauritius, for me, represents possibly one of the examples of what it means to actually have a meaningful relationship between government and the private sector that is geared towards a deliberate commitment to economic growth and never sitting still in terms of creation of jobs. Some of these anecdotes and examples clearly were given even here in Botswana of how the Mauritian government moved from a situation where maybe the link or the relationship between government and private sector was not so strong and the movement was not just on the government side but also on the private sector side. So possibly here I'm asking for a lot more seriousness on both sides. We cannot just be having a meeting just for the sake of having a meeting and then having another meeting in two years. Where are the jobs? As far as I understand, and sometimes this is disputed, government does create jobs. As far as I know, and I think the research even confirms this, there are two ways in which government can drive job creation. If government goes on a spending spree, and especially one that's targeted towards infrastructure, schools, hospitals, and so on and so forth, clearly jobs will be created. Coupled with that, the second method where government would create jobs or, that, or possibly push the process of job creation would be in making sure that there's an enabling environment for business to thrive. And normally this way you'd have pro-business legislation and regulation, coupled obviously with supportive monetary policy regime. On the private sector side, there's also two ways in which the private sector creates jobs, as far as we understand. It's entrepreneurship, especially in an environment where the number of small and medium-sized organizations or firms or enterprises are growing in number. But in some of our economies, sadly, the opposite is true. Just imagine, in this room, maybe you're a good 200 people or so. If maybe 100 of you post this presentation, choose to actually join the private sector and run a business and employ anything from three to nine people, you can do the multiplication for yourselves. That is why entrepreneurship is a powerful tool for creating employment. And the feature of developed economies and why they're able to hold jobs or maybe even create jobs is because clearly, if you look at the number of small and medium-sized firms, normally they'll be in the majority. But if you look at the African setting mostly and some of the developing countries that are struggling to create jobs, you find a concept that even the IMF and the World Bank call the missing middle. The small and medium-sized enterprises in terms of growth is just stunted. And again, because of dysfunctional things that government and possibly the private sector does in terms of a relationship, I want to be exceedingly clear. The quality of the relationship. In other words, are the two parties coming together to make sure that we create jobs? The second method on the private sector side that we all understand is one where it's fairly difficult to create jobs. And normally this is where innovation sits, where jobs are created through ideas. So there's evidence of innovation, of creativity, of invention, and also of investment into those very ideas. The most difficult method, but one that's proven to actually hold jobs for much longer. Examples here that come to mind for me would be, for example, the ICT industry. A three trillion dollar industry. And with the promise of the fourth industrial revolution, for example, software development is coming back. It just shows you. There's even a deficit in terms of the number of software developers to fulfill the promise of the fourth industrial revolution. The work that I do normally challenges us to listen to problems that clients have. 
and come up with possibly a solution. And sometimes when a client narrates what the problems are, sometimes I always say to myself, these are not really pro problems, these are possibly challenges, but I'm more, I'm more interested in what the root cause is. So for us in the private sector, we've tried to respond to this challenge because at the end of the day, government cannot do it on its own. Sometimes I fault the private sector, the lazy private sector, in terms of actually coming up with ideas, especially on the entrepreneurship side and also in generation of ideas, especially the source of ideas that will make sure that economies of Africa grow and hold jobs. It's a concept, we call it the Creative Technology Hub. We saw it through a party that we are linked with and they were doing it in Saudi Arabia and the Saudi government wanted to give respectable work to its women and they chose the digital learning industry. An industry that when I check the numbers, the latest figures say is destined to grow to $600 billion by 2021. So the question that I have is, why aren't we part of this party? We're not part of the Industrial Revolution. We're not part of the ICT Revolution. Research and development surely is going to pass us by. But here's but possibly an industry that I feel, given the fact that, for example, in Botswana, we've got so many young graduates, ICT, ICT graduates, possibly it could be one that we could put our last dollar on. So the model is replicated here in Botswana and we're working tirelessly with a state-owned entity. Because sometimes I think, again, just to buttress the fact that normally it would be a government entity possibly and the private sector that will come up with a solution. And we've decided to actually put that to a test. We've tweaked it, but we've made it relevant certainly for the local context. And the primary focus here is to create or to develop skills for the youth and also to drive job creation. In addition, we believe going forward there should be a capability to design and develop digital and blended learning solutions locally, and principally to transfer the know-how that will come from outside of our borders to Botswana, to drive the development of a digital learning sector, similar to Saudi Arabia. It's a model that's got different elements, but the idea is that the young people should come into this hub and learn skills that are varied so that they come out of the hub with a firm understanding of what it means to, pro to deliver or to produce a world-class digital learning product. The aspects of project management, at the end of the day, each and every single project has to start and end on time. They have to understand that. Learning experience design, Animation would sit in there, software de development, management and leadership, and principally entrepreneurship, because we were hoping that some of the kids coming from here will be able to go out and be net employers as entrepreneurs. Simply put, we foresee a situation where apprentices or interns will come into the hub, they'll be employed by the hub, they'll be trained within the hub by experts, and certainly, they should be able to produce world-class products that will be consumed by either government, education, corporates, and we see an opportunity as well here in Africa in terms of development of digital products. What do I mean by that? If a young Mutswana has illustrated a, a rhino, and a rhino is supposed to be animated and running, it should look like a rhino. If a young West African has actually illustrated a mask from Ghana, it should look different from a mask from Nigeria. In terms of numbers, we're fairly confident that the model will scale up. But in three years, we're looking at having trained about 360 young people and created employment for them. Some of them will jump out of the hub and set up their own business, and that would be encouraged. In terms of my vision going forward, I foresee a situation where, through this process, where basically we are pronouncing entrepreneurship, 
We're pronouncing also the generation of ideas. We're pronouncing the, the development of skills that we feel are relevant for the future. We should be able to see young, competent Botswana like Tabo with world-class skills in digital technology. We should be able to see good quality digital technology learning jobs basically littered within the economy. We should be able to see a thriving digital learning sector going forward with possibly an opportunity to actually export. And chiefly, entrepreneurs in this space. From the model, we've identified that you could actually have young people coming out to set up their own animation studios and possibly providing the service to the studios in New York or in, in Silicon Valley. In Cape Town, is actually happening. We foresee a situation where software developers would come up and possibly delight us with the ability to do gamification, something that is used within digital learning. Production of videos and so on and so forth. So going forward, I see a totally different picture. If our educational systems were to transform or totally be overhauled to try and usher in and accommodate digital learning technology and to be abreast of some of the mega trends that we see in the world so that our youth can firmly be part and puzzle of the coming fourth industrial revolution. Thank you.